Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to uh, CS206, uh, teaching remotely through Twitch. I uh, hope you're all doing well this morning. Uh, just as a reminder uh, where we are and where we're going, we are working our way through uh, our section on open problems and evolutionary uh, robotics. And we're focusing on a current series of lectures that are looking at the problem known as crossing the reality gap. We started by looking at putting noise on simple simulators, 3D printing as many simulated robots as possible to see which ones transfer and which ones uh, don't. We then looked at the Resilient Machines project where we assumed that the physical robot collected experiences from the real world and used it to evolve simulators and then used the best evolved simulator to uh, evolve controllers for transferal. Then we looked at the transferability uh, project where the idea was to get better and better over evolutionary time at predicting which controllers would transfer from simulation to reality uh, well. And we're going to finish uh, lecture 19 shortly where the idea was before we ever deploy the physical robot into its environment, we train as many good and diverse controllers in simulation as possible so that if, so that if something goes wrong with the physical robot, it can reach back into its diverse portfolio of controllers and find another one that works in its uh, damaged state. So we'll jump back into that uh, in a moment. But again, just some housekeeping uh, as a reminder for the University of Vermont students that are on the stream. Uh, there's an attendance sheet for today. Just make sure, don't forget to click on the link uh, and fill in whether you are here or not. And uh, you are undergraduates. You're working now on your final project where you're trying to sketch out. You're trying to sketch out uh, an idea of what's feasible in the five or so weeks that we. Uh, have left, and that's what you're going to be supplying for your first weekly uh, report on Monday evening. Any questions about final project, weekly reports, reality gap questions? We're all good? Okay. If I don't, uh, just as a reminder, please do type your questions in the chat at any time uh, if you have any. Okay, so back to robots that uh, respond like animals. Just as a refresher, we're looking at not just trying to create robots that can adapt to unexpected damage, but they can do it rapidly like animals are able uh, to do. And the way we are trying to do that is to evolve uh, our search for good controllers on our simulated hexapod. And if our simulated hexapod has 100 synaptic weights, then we have a 101 dimensional fitness landscape, 100 horizontal dimensions for the values of each of the 100 synapses. And the height of any point in those 100 horizontal dimensions, the height represents how far the hexapetal robot moves in the forward direction. As we are evolving those controllers, we are dropping them into a lower dimensional space. And you can think of this as a six dimensional space where each of the six dimensions, and only two are shown here, represent the fraction of time that any one of the six feet spend on the ground when being run by that uh, controller. And the seventh dimension, which is represented here as color, is fitness. We have a corresponding seven-dimensional confidence space, which represents, at that particular point in the seventh-dimensional space, how confident the physical robot is that this particular controller, for example, will do well when transferred to reality. All the cool colors here represent that at the moment, the physical robot has no confidence about how any of the controllers will transfer to reality. However, after transferring one controller, which transfers poorly to uh, reality, we depress the colors here. Most of these controllers are probably not going to transfer well, and we're pretty confident about that. And if we repeat this process, even after just a few trials, the physical robot starts to fill out this behavioral space and uh, the confidence space and has a pretty good understanding, has high confidence here and here and here about how these controllers, these controllers, and these controllers will transfer to uh, reality. 
Okay. Uh, so we uh, we ended last time by watch, watching a video and by looking at some of the uh, damage scenarios. C1 is there's no damage at all. C2, half of one leg is missing. C3, a leg is permanently bent. An entire leg is missing. Two entire legs are missing. And uh, the morphology of a leg has changed. So let's, uh, let's finish up uh, lecture, uh, this lecture by looking at these six different damage scenarios. And hopefully you can see in the stream here, yeah, it should be relatively clear. Uh, the yellow stars here represent the walking speed in meters per second of the robot after it's experienced damage. So obviously the yellow star up here, uh, the robot is obviously able to move relatively quickly because C1 is the undamaged state. The other five damage scenarios, obviously there actually is damage to the machine and the robot moves relatively uh, slowly. The purple bars that you see here is the speed of the robot after just two or three or four or five or a handful of physical trials. And you can see that a lot of these pur purple bars are about as high as the undamaged uh, yellow star, indicating that the robot has recovered almost uh, as much speed as it had before. And in case C6, uh, this case down here, the robot is actually traveling faster than it did in the undamaged uh, state. Okay, um, how about this panel here? It, uh, it says here, alternative descriptor. What that means is, remember that, uh, remember that we are using a description or we're compressing all of the controllers in this low dimensional space using the fraction of time that the six legs spend on the ground. We could imagine an alternative encoding where instead of watching how long each of the six legs spends on the ground, we could record the mean height of the robot's body during travel. Uh, maybe it drags its belly on the ground or stands on its tippy toes and its uh, center of mass is high. And we could also measure the standard deviation, how much the height of the robot's body uh, moves up and down. We took those two features that describe the behavior produced by any one controller. We would have a two-dimensional space and different controllers that cause the robot to have different mean and standard deviation of height during travel would indicate where in that two-dimensional space to put uh, that controller. So that would be an alternate descriptor. So what they're showing us uh, in their alternative descriptor here, which wasn't actually mean and standard deviation of height, it was something else, but it doesn't really matter, that again, even with a few uh, physical trials, even after severe damage, which is the case of C3 here, uh, the robot is barely moving at all. After a few physical trials, it's able to start moving uh, again. Okay. Uh, what they're showing down here is the same data, but now they're showing the actual number of trials it took to recover. So let's take uh, let's take um, uh, C6, which was this one here. It took only three physical trials to recover this amount of speed, which is about 0.3 meters per second. And you can see in the inset here, those three trials took about 30 seconds, very, very quick. Alternatively, in C5, where the robot is missing two entire uh, legs, it takes about uh, 14 or 15 trials, and those 15 trials took about two minutes um, to recover this much speed, which was about 7.17 meters per second on the severely damaged robot. So it makes sense, but shows that there's relatively rapid recovery and that rapid recovery leads to significant recovery compared to how fast the robot is traveling immediately after damage. Okay, and as we saw in the video last time, they also ran their algorithm on a different robot to show that their algorithm is general. It's not specific to any one robot. The task here was for the robot arm to uh, take this uh, orange ball and drop it into the can. They looked at three different scenarios in this case. Um, C1 is that the, the joint, one of the joints is stuck at 45 
uh, degrees. Let's see if I can show this in the video here. So imagine that my elbow is uh, stuck here. There we go. Uh, so no matter what commands they send to the elbow joint, it doesn't rotate. It's stuck at 45 uh, degrees. In C2, they looked at a joint with a permanent 45 degree offset. So uh, if the normal joint operates uh, like this, the, off, the 45 degree offset would mean when they send any commands, it's doing something like this, not what it intended. The robot intended to do this, and instead the robot is doing something like this. Okay, and in C3, you can see they added these two different uh, damage uh, events to the robot. And again, in this case, with less than 10 uh, trials, they were able to uh, recover. The, the, the damage arm was able to successfully uh, drop the ball in the can, even though it was, was damaged. Okay, I, I think we'll wrap things up there as I'm switching from lecture 19 to 20. If there are any questions, please remember to just type them into uh, chat. Okay. Um, in this final lecture in our uh, series on crossing the, crossing the reality gap, we're going to look at a very recent project where they were actually able to 3D print a complete robot. If you remember our discussion about the Golem project, which was uh, reported in the literature uh, 20 years ago in 2000, um, they printed some parts of the robot out of plastic and then snapped the motors and electronics into the robot. In this case, uh, in this recent project, we're going to actually 3D print uh, or manufacture the whole robot. So let's have a look at this project. As uh, the name of this project mentioned, we're going to look at 3D printing a one-dimensional robot, which seems a little bit strange. We're going to have this uh, tape, which we're going to uh, extrude. We're going to assume the tape is already available. We're going to extrude it through a printhead, and when we do, that printhead is going to shape and fold this one-dimensional tape into an arbitrary three-dimensional uh, shape and then fold it and deploy the robot. The robot is going to do its thing. Um, the orange parts of the tape represent the motors, which we'll talk about uh, in a moment. And the neat idea, uh, one of the neat ideas behind this project is that once the folded robot is done doing whatever it's supposed to be doing, we can recycle the tape. We can straighten the, type, the tape and feed it back into uh, the machine. And uh, refold it in a different way. In this case, it's some sort of legged machine that's able to walk over uneven uh, terrain. And when the robot is done, straighten the tape, feed it back into the 3D printer, print another robot, in this case a robot for climbing, and rinse uh, and repeat. So this is not just 3D printing of 1D robots, but 3D printing of recyclable robots. Okay, so what's the idea here? Well, um, if you read the paper, you'll notice that they refer to these robots as ribosomal robots, based on, inspired by uh, ribosomes from biology. So we're going to take a, a five-minute detour here into um, back into genetics, which you may remember uh, from your biology classes. There are two steps to taking uh, DNA and turning it into proteins. There is transcription followed by translation. Transcription starts with DNA and translates that DNA into RNA. We won't go through the details of this, but RNA then escapes from the cell or escapes from the cell nucleus and the exposed edge of the RNA then accepts these purple ribosomes. Ribosomes move their way along this one-dimensional structure, this RNA tape, and as they do, they keep adding pieces. Uh, they, they start adding pieces together, which are the parts that make up uh, a protein or a polypeptide. So why is this a ribosomal robot? Because the idea here is that we're going to read off some evolved instructions. In this case, we're going to read off uh, an, a robot that was evolved in simulation. We're going to read the instructions that were, uh, we're going to read off 
this evolved robot and then 3D print it one piece at a time. So here's our ribosome reading and extruding a one-dimensional tape, which depending on the nature of that tape, as dictated by the instructions, will fold into a particular 3D shape. And the 3D shape dictates once this protein or this 1D robot in our case is released, how it will uh, behave. Okay, so I'm gonna play the short video so you can see this at work and then we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the various components of it. Okay, so uh, so you can you get the basic idea of how this works. Uh, let's push on. Okay, uh, so um, as you can see, there was a simulation reality side uh, to this project. Um, they're going to be evolving the 3D uh, shapes of these robots, the physical structure of these robots, and their controllers. So let's have a look at how this uh, works. You'll notice uh, the genotype is shown in uh, panel A, and then various different phenotypes or different evolved robots are shown through pa panels B through F. What is this phenotype? What is the data structure uh, that's being used to encode uh, instructions for how to build these 1D robots. Should uh, this this particular kind of genome should look familiar to you? You've seen it before. If you recognize it, please type your answer into chat.
Exactly. So what we're looking at here is a CPPN or compositional pattern producing network. And the reason we know that is you notice there are these little inset graphs inside each of these circles. And these inset graphs are representing activation functions. They show how the raw input arriving at the neuron is translated into a value that is supplied along the outgoing synapse uh, from the neuron. So in this particular CPPN, we're looking at a CPPN that has five different neurons and a number of synapses. So uh, when, we saw, when we saw CPPNs before, um, we, sh we saw how they could, for example, paint a various picture inside uh, a two-dimensional space. We saw how, for example, we saw how, for example, uh, they could paint a gradient. Uh, for example, we had a CPPN that connected the X and Y neuron to an output, the amount of gray, or in this case, I guess, the amount of black. If we just connected X to the output neuron, let me just make this a little larger so you can see better. And we saw this before, uh, we could, we saw this before, we could, for example, paint a gradient that gets increasingly dark as we move towards uh, more X and lighter and lighter to the left. What we're seeing now is not painting a pattern inside a two-dimensional space. We talked about painting patterns inside a three-dimensional space uh, as well. Instead, we're going to be painting a pattern across, as you can imagine here, a one-dimensional space, which is the length of the 1D robot. So what they're feeding in here is P, which is the position along the length of the robot. So this might be P equals 1, P equals 2, P equals 3, P equals 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and all the way along the length uh, of the robot. They're also supplying at the third input uh, value a bias. Remember this is just a single constant uh, value that's uh, being fed into the neural network. And then they also supplied this third input uh, value, which is the sine of P. Um, you, could, you can probably guess that that's a pretty strong hint that the investigators are trying to give to the evolutionary algorithm to produce regular patterns along the length or along the increasing positions of the robot, like these repeating spirals you can see in panel, uh, panel C. Okay, so that's the input. We're using, we're gonna be evolving populations of CPPNs. This is one CPPN here. We're gonna be evolving CPPNs to paint patterns along this one dimensional length. And what do we do once we have that pattern? Or, or, I'm sorry, what is that pattern? We have two output neurons in our CPPN. The first one represents the bend angle. So if we have uh, P equals I and P equals I plus one, the next segment in the 1D uh, robot, are we, are we going to bend it by minus 30 degrees or plus 30 degrees? And as you saw in the video, the second output neuron is indicating the bend direction. So how, uh, what is the angle of the bend when it's made? And that angle can be any of uh, 180, uh, any, any angle between one and 180 degrees. So um, the machine itself, the machine itself, as we saw in the video, has actually two motors, one here and one here. One motor is responsible for rotating the rotating the one-dimensional tape that's being fed down. It's rotating the tape. And then the second one is bending, pushing or pulling on the wire to bend it at minus 31, uh, minus 30 or plus 30. So that's what the pattern that's being painted by the CPPN is doing. It's dictating how neighboring segments are bent relative to one another. And as you saw in the video, there are these embedded motors uh, at a certain uh, locations along the length of the robot.
Okay. There are, uh, so if you think about sort of the space of possible 1D robots given this, if we, uh, in, the, in the paper itself, they created robots that had anywhere between 50 and 100 segments uh, in length. So we're looking at the number of folds, so there are n minus 1 folds. If we have n segments, there are n minus 1 junctions between neighboring uh, segments. And if you do some of the combinatorics here, you can convince yourself that this is a very, very large uh, space. So even though the robots themselves are very, very simple, um, at least in theory, evolution can create very complex and very diverse shapes, leading to very complex and diverse functions. Just to relate back to biology for a moment, uh, you may remember from biology class that once a, uh, once a protein is translated from RNA and deployed, the shape or the sequence, or sorry, the sequence of, polypepti of peptides along the polypeptide length, along the length of the protein, they dictate perfectly the 3D shape that the protein will fold into, and the shape of the protein dictates how it will behave. So form equals function. Same thing with our 1D uh, robots. Their shape more or less dictates their function. There's one difference, one important difference between 1D robots and proteins, which is these robots are able to uh, self-actuate. They're able to uh, move themselves. How do they do that? Well, in addition to these two output neurons from the CPPN that we just talked about, which dictate how to make the shape of the robot, there is a third and a fourth output neuron. And I wasn't able to draw this very well in this cartoon, but we have this third and fourth output uh, neuron. The third output neuron, whenever, uh, whenever the tape gets to a motor, the CBPN will paint two numbers onto that motor. The amplitude at which uh, the amplitude at which the motor will turn, and the motor is going to rotate about its long axis. So, if you think about my uh, upper, if you think about my upper arm as uh, say uh, one half of the motor, and my hand as the other half, it's going to twist about its long axis. Okay, so the amplitude at which it rotates is dictated by the third output neuron, and the phase offset is also dictated by the fourth and final output neuron. So if we have two different motors embedded in the 1D robot, and they're painted, both of those two motors get exactly the same uh, value of phi here, then they will, both, uh, they will both rotate at the same phase offset. One of them may have higher amplitude than the other. Let's see if I could do that. Um, alternatively, we might have two motors that have paint the exact same amplitude, but have very different phase offsets. So they rotate uh, at different uh, 180 degrees relative to one another. Right. So we've, kind of, we've seen this before in some other robots. Um, there are no sensors in this case. Um, we are just uh, rotate, we, we just have motors. That is known as, um, in robotics, that's known as open loop control. Why is it called open loop control? It's called open loop control because the robot is pushing against its environment. And because the robot has no sensors, it can't sense, it can't, uh, it can't observe the repercussions of its action. So there is an open loop. The robot is doing something, but there's nothing coming back into the robot. If we have sensors on the robot, and those sensors are connected to the motors, then we have closed loop control. So closed loop control is a robot that's able to push against the world with its motors and observe the sensory repercussions of its action push those sensory repercussions through its neural network down to its motors, decide what to do at the next time step, and so on. So this is a robot capable, the robot we're looking at at the moment is capable of open loop uh, control. Any questions so far before we move on? No? Okay. 
Okay, let's have a look at the uh, fitness function. This, this paper has a pretty interesting fitness function. Um, we're going to start by computing the difference between the starting position of any one simulated robot. All of the evolution was done in simulation. Start with the starting position of the robot, compute its ending position, and take the absolute difference between those two positions, which is selecting for distance. We've seen this many times before. They're going to multiply by this term here, 1 minus TQ, where TQ represents the maximum torque of the robot. And as we mentioned before, torque is the rotational force that's applied uh, by the motor. We're going to assume in this case that torque has been normalized, so that zero torque means the motor is not doing anything. And a torque of 1 is the maximum amount of torque that these particular cylindrical robots can apply uh, that can apply. So uh, you can see here the 1 minus this value represents we're trying to minimize torque. So we want the robot to travel as far as possible using as little torque, as little power as possible. They also uh, evolved robots to be compact. So they were trying to minimize TQ and maximize C, where C is meant to represent the compactness of the robot. What's compactness? Well, compactness, they computed at using the following, where uh, COM is the center of mass of the robot. So once the CPPN has folded the robot into its 3D shape, as you see here, they take the position, the 3D position of every segment in the robot and average all of those positions. And when you do, you get back a 3D vector uh, which a 3D uh, a position in three-dimensional space, which represents the center of mass of the robot. To compute the pack, the compactness, then they then revisit each element uh, in the robot, each segment in the robot. Take the position, the x, y, and z position of the ith segment, and compute the distance between that segment and the center of mass. They sum up all of those distances from segment, all segments to the center of mass. And you can convince yourself that obviously if all of the positions are at the center of mass, you have uh, a sum of zero distances and you have something that is maximally compact. What is the, min the, what it, what is the shape here of the least compact robot possible? While you're thinking about that, I'll answer Daniel's question. Uh, how does the robot know how much distance it has traveled if it has no sensors? So the simulated robot has no idea how far it's traveled, but the evolutionary algorithm does. So in the same way that your simulated robot, before you put a position sensor in it, your simulated robot has no idea how far the robot has traveled, uh, but you can compute that in uh, simulation. Um, absolutely. The, uh, the least compact robot you can imagine is a, is a straight line. Okay, so they kind of threw this term in here probably to get some, some interesting shapes. Um, you could imagine that if you're selecting for something that is that travels a long way and uses relatively little torque, if you did not have the C term, what kinds of shapes do you think you would get and what kinds of behavior would those shapes be capable of? So if you weren't selecting for compactness, but you were selecting for distance and minimal torque, what kinds of forms and functions might you get? Not an easy thing to do. You have to try and run an evol uh, evolutionary algorithm in your head. Uh, peristalsis, uh, possibly, um, straight line robots. So obviously, if we're not selecting for C, you're going to get a robot that's more or less a straight line. Uh, we might get peristalsis, uh, although I think that would probably be difficult in this robot because it's a, a long wire uh, is not able to stay stable while it does peristalsis. Um, my guess, although it's not reported in this paper, is they probably got rolling along uh, the long axis of, of the robot. Who knows? 
Okay. Um, they added some additional terms to this fitness function. Um, this gets a little bit confusing. Now they're dividing by 1 plus CL, where CL is an integer. Um, it's a positive integer, um, which is basically the number of self-collisions. So they wanted a robot that was compact, but they didn't want a lot of self-collisions uh, during simulation. Because as you might be able to guess by now, uh, robots that have a lot of self-collisions are going to be difficult to trans translate to uh, reality. Detecting collisions and resolving them in a simulator is a, is a difficult matter, and it's hard to get that exactly right. So it turns out that it's easier to transfer non-self-colliding uh, robots from simulation uh, to reality. If you parse this equation, you can convince yourself that they're trying to maximize F1, so they want to try and minimize CL on the denominator, but guard against getting a denominator value of 0 by adding 1 to CL. Okay, they then had a second fitness objective. So now we have F1 and F2, um, and F2 is going to be phenotypic novelty, which we'll talk about in a moment, but just remember that phenotype means the behavior or the thing produced by the genotype. So in this experiment, the genotype or the genotypes are CPPNs, and the phenotypes are shapes and behaviors of 1D robots. You'll notice that they have these two objectives, but they are not multiplying them together. That gives you a strong hint of the particular kind of evolutionary algorithm they used here. What was that evolutionary algorithm? We introduced it just, uh, just recently. Exactly. They're going to be using a multi-objective optimization uh, algorithm here, or MU. Um, they're actually using BOO, a bi-objective optimization, because we have two objectives. Okay, so what is the second objective, P? Uh, P is this phenotypic novelty. Well, this actually should look similar to something we've seen before. Imagine that we take uh, all of the we take uh, we take a, uh, we have a population of genomes here. Let's start with that genome one through one hundred. Let's say we take genome two in red here. We take genome two and we use it to fold uh, to create a one D robot, which gives us P two a, a, a phenotype two. We can then embed that phenotype in a high dimensional space by looking at, at each of the n minus 1 uh, junctions between neighboring segments, we look at the bend direction and the bend angle. We have a 50 segment robot. We have 49 junctions. For each of those 49 junctions, we have two numbers, bend direction and bend angle. So 49 times 2 is a 98. So we can imagine a 98 dimensional space where each point in that nine-dimensional space represents a robot with a different shape. We're going to ignore the amplitude and the phase offset for now. We can then compute the phenotypic, uh, the phenotypic novelty of P2 here by looking at its K nearest neighbors. Here's the K over here. This cartoon here, we have K equals 3. We're looking at three other folded 1D robots, and obviously they occupy different positions in this 98-dimensional space. And we can then simply take the distance between X, which in our example here is P2, and the other, uh, the other robots. So the three black arrows that you see here represent the three distances between the, the uh, robot we're interested in, and it's k equals three neighbors. We sum up all of those distances, and we want to try, and we can normalize by k, and we're going to try and maximize 
uh, this P, I don't know why it's rho here, this should probably be P. We're going to try and maximize this term. We want to select for robots that are as far from other robots in the population, where far represents that they have very different shapes, and therefore probably very different behavior. So far, so good. So this is a little bit different from what we've seen before. Um, uh, F, objective one is looking at features of just uh, an individual robot. Feature two is the fitness of the robot, uh, sort of using features not just of the, of the robot itself, but also other robots in the population. Okay. Uh, so here's just a, a, a picture showing how the, uh, we'll look at the hardware to end off this lecture. Um, here's just a little bit more detail about the motors. As I, as I promised you before, uh, we, can, we can think of these motors as rotating along their long axis, and the CPPN is painting uh, phi 1 and phi 2, which is the amplitude in this case, and also not shown in this figure, the phase offset of how they rotate relative to one another. Okay, here's a little bit of a uh, um, zoom in on the, uh, the actual 3D printer themselves. So we could argue about whether this, uh, this machine is actually printing the robot. Um, maybe it's extruding it, but we could see a little bit how this works. We have the print head and the bending pin, so two motors here dictating the bend angle uh, and the, the, bend, the bend angle and the positive or negative bend. Uh, the feed mechanism, and so on. So a relatively simple device to print a relatively simple robot. As you can probably imagine, in this case, the goal for these researchers was to try and create the simplest printer that would print sort of the simplest robot they could imagine. And then in follow-up work, they're hoping to uh, complexify both the machine and the robot itself. So uh, this work was only reported, uh, I don't have the date here, one or two years ago. So it's a very recent uh, project. Okay, uh, we, saw this in the, we saw this in the video. This is just a time-lapse uh, series of snapshots showing the extrusion of one of the better evolved robots. And uh, in this case, as we saw in the video, they did a pretty good job of crossing the sim to real gap. Again, although these robots are relatively simple, what they saw in simulation more or less matched what they got in uh, reality. Okay, this is a relatively uh, short lecture, so uh, we will move on in a moment in case, unless there are any questions. Please feel free to ask them in chat while I'm changing slides. Okay, so um, that concludes our discussion of uh, 3D printing of 1D robots. It also finishes our discussion of this lecture series on crossing the reality gap. Just as a reminder, we're actually working our way through this overall theme of challenges uh, in the field. So we're gonna switch now from the reality gap to a different open challenge in the field, which is scalability. So in everything we've seen so far, uh, in all of the projects, there was one or a couple of researchers and they were building either one or a few robots or building a 3D printer that would print at most 12 or 15 robots. One of the open questions in the field is if evolutionary robotics is, is ever going to be a serious science, we're going to have to figure out a way to scale it. So how do we scale up? so that instead of one or a few researchers evolving robots, we can collectively have larger and larger numbers of people evolving more and more diverse robots that are printed and manufactured and deployed into the world in different ways. We're gonna look at uh, two different projects uh, uh, today and next week. We're going to start today with the Twitch Plays uh, Robotics Project. This is one a project from my group. We're going to look at a second project from my group uh, 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 next week, the DotBot Project. Uh, in both of these, these uh, attempts 
to, to solve the problem of scalability, the solution is going to be crowdsourcing. So instead of a few experts evolving robots, can we create a system that allows large numbers of non-experts to evolve robots? How do we build that crowdsourcing infrastructure? Um, and as the name implies, this is something that we, uh, we ran on Twitch, and we'll uh, talk about that now. Okay. Okay, so um, in order to introduce the Twitch Plays Robotics project and how it uh, and how we crowdsource this and how it might help with that, we're going to start from a very different location. We're going to start with language and we're going to go all the way back to uh, something we've already seen before, which is the Chinese room problem. Just as a reminder, the Chinese room problem was actually formulated by the philosopher John Searle, and this was, was an attack on Alan Turing's um, uh, assertion that we can never define intelligence, we can only ever point at it when we see it. And uh, Turing defended that with the Turing test. If something acts or speaks intelligently, then it is intelligent. Searle proposed the Chinese room problem where the room as a whole acts as if it understands Mandarin, even though the room cannot, by Searle's definition, understand uh, language. Uh, I won't go back through the details of the Chinese room, but just as a reminder, there's someone in the room who is basically uh, replacing one symbol with a bunch of other symbols. Um, which raises this question of what does it actually mean to understand uh, language. So if all you're doing is replacing one symbol with other symbols, do you actually understand language? That idea uh, informed some of the early work in AI, which we've already seen some of it. Uh, we, saw, um, we saw the robot psychologist that would receive a question or a statement typed in by a human in chat. It would move some of the words around uh, and send a, an answer back. And that was the ELISA project. For a lot of people, ELISA seemed to act intelligently, even though the only thing ELISA was really doing was moving symbols uh, around. Here's an, another approach like that from the 80s, which is actually still running today. You can Google the Psych Project and learn more about it. This is an attempt to try and codify uh, much of the text that's available out there on the web, tag each word with various symbols, and connect those symbols together with other symbols or propositions. So in this case, we have a special symbol called is a, and that symbol connects the Bill Clinton symbol with the United States president symbol. Tree is a generalization of plant, uh, sorry, plant is a generalization of tree, and so on. So Psych attempts to learn a bunch of these relationships, but raises the inevitable question of, is Psych any better than the Chinese room, which is simply moving symbols about? Is there another option? This is also, uh, actually I think in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip over this. Um, there is another option, which is, uh, it turns out that if you, uh, if, you image a, um, if you image someone who is sitting in a, bra um, a brain imaging device, like a magnetic resonance imaging or MRI uh, device, that if they are sitting in that device and they are, for example, tapping their index finger and thumb together, as you see in the picture here, there is a particular point on the surface of the brain that becomes active. If they uh, clap their hands together, as you see here, there is a nearby point in the brain that lights up. If they twist their wrist while they're in the imager, there is yet another uh, close by position in the brain that lights up. And if you ask them to move various parts of their body, you'll notice that various positions along what is known as the motor strip light up. And the motor strip is exactly that part of the brain that would be covered if you were wearing uh, earmuffs. So um, what does that have to do with language? It turns out that a few years ago, uh, some neural scientists realized that instead of asking someone to, uh, to pick up an object while they're sitting in the device, you could instead 
uh, tell them the word, they, you could tell them the word pick. So while they're sitting in the imaging device, they're hearing the word pick, or they themselves are saying the word pick. And when they do, the part of the motor strip that has to do with the arm or the hand lights up. So if someone is either picking or hearing the word pick or saying the word pick, that part of the motor strip in the brain lights up. Interestingly, if the uh, subject is lying in the uh, imaging device and they hear words that sound very similar, lick, pick, and kick, you might imagine because those words sound similar that they would light up nearby parts of the brain, and it turns out they don't. They light up different parts of the brain along the motor strip. So what that suggests, and there's been many studies of this since, is that there is a very deep relationship between language and action or the body. So in most attempts to, do, to solve language in AI, uh, the body does not play a role. There is simply uh, attempts to try and create code that moves symbols about. But it seems that humans don't do it that way. Another way to think about this is imagine that you wanted to try and teach a robot uh, to read Egyptian hieroglyphs, or you, wanted, you yourself wanted to learn Egyptian hieroglyphs, and I gave you a hieroglyph to hieroglyph dictionary. So you see some particular hier hieroglyph, you don't know what it means, but you look up in the book and you look for that hieroglyph, you find that hieroglyph, and the definition of that hieroglyph is written in a series of other hieroglyphics. So you need to take each of those, look them up in the book, and around and around you go in a circle, and it's hard to escape. So the idea that is growing in neuroscience, that the way that humans escape from that circle is by grounding language in actions. And we're going to come back to what we mean by this grounding uh, in a moment, and again relate it back in a moment to uh, scaling up evolutionary robotics. We're going to look at uh, one other example, um, and this one comes from linguistics, so the study of language, that also uh, has found hints in language itself that humans understand language by uh, understand language by tying it to the body. So here are a couple of English idioms. Um, so these are sayings. Let's start with don't jump to conclusions. Imagine that you're in an argument with someone. Uh, they offer their opinion. You are, offer yours. Uh, they negate you and offer the next one. They, and you accuse them of jumping to conclusions. Imagine that the person that you're arguing with has ne is not a native English speaker and has never heard the idiom, don't jump to conclusions before. For many non-native English speakers that have never heard this idiom before, they can figure out what it means without the native English speaker having to explain it to them. And the reason why most people can understand this is the understanding of jump. There is something about the action of jump in the human body that leads to passing over important things. That is sort of what jump means. So if you imagine a series of uh, arguments or claims and that chain is trying to build up to a conclusion, you might accuse the person you're arguing with of jumping over some part uh, of the, the argument. Here's another one, which is don't look back in anger. If you think about this idiom, it seems strange because what are you looking back at? There is a related idiom to this, which is I'm looking forward to seeing you all in person again, hopefully before the end of the semester. I'm looking forward to the birthday party next week. I'm looking forward to dinner. Why this relationship between looking back and looking forward. So if you think about this one, don't look back in anger, it's implying that you're looking back at something that happened in the past, and I'm looking forward to dinner tonight, I'm looking forward to a future event. Why this connection in English between looking back, metaphorically looking back at past events, and metaphorically looking forward to future events?
why don't we look back to future events and look forward to past events? It feels very non-intuitive because <laughs> it's the name of a famous song, uh, but the song is based on the idiom. The idiom came first. We think in a timeline, absolutely we think in a timeline, but again, we could think in such a sense that looking back implies back into the future and forward implies forward into the past, which again seems non-intuitive. There are other languages besides English that also tend to uh, connect looking forward with future events and looking backwards with past events. Why does the opposite seem so non-intuitive? Exactly. As, uh, as EBC says, um, the reason why is that there is an implicit unspoken connection here to human physiology. When you are walking, most of the time you're walking forward, meaning in the direction of your primary sense organs, which are your eyes. So what you're seeing in front of you, assuming that most of the time you're walking forward, is in your future. You're about to approach that object or that person and interact with them. If you are walking forward and you look back over your shoulder, you're seeing things that you've passed or that you encountered in your recent past. So because of the human body, because of the human body, we tend to acu uh, uh, equate looking forward with the future events and looking back with backward events. So yeah, idioms and metaphors uh, and analogies in language tend to contain hints about this connection between human physiology and abstract uh, abstract concepts like language. So there is a actually very large number of these embodied metaphors. So don't jump to conclusions. Don't look back in, in anger. I'm looking forward to uh, the birthday party next week. What are some other embodied metaphors you can think of? Um, I'm a native English speaker, so I'll just take uh, ones that are written in English for the moment. Take a minute or two and type down any you can think of uh, in chat. And remember as you're doing this that the, the clue here is you're thinking about idioms like this that are somehow connected with action and the body. Jumping causes you to pass over objects on the ground. Looking forward, you're looking at future events. Looking backwards, you're looking at backward events. What are some other embodied metaphors you can think of? takes a while to, to, to get the hang of this game, but once you get going, there are a large number of them because eventually you warm up to the task. Don't close your eyes. Uh, that's true. I think you mean don't close your eyes because you could miss it, right? If you close your eyes, there's a rapid event that you might miss. Uh, killing two birds with one stone. Yes, true, that's definitely an action. Uh, yeah, that's true. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Yeah, that's another, that's another good one, absolutely. Drowning in stress, very maybe perhaps appropriate one for, for this week, uh, absolutely. My stress levels are rising. So there is something about up and down relative to the body that also seems intuitive, which for some people has to do with rising water levels. Uh, my stress levels are rising. Other ideas? Okay, I'm not going to move on until I hear some more. I'm not going to take this lying down. A leap of faith, perfect. That's a great one. That's a great one. Okay. All right. I uh, I won't put you under too much pressure to think up more embodied uh, metaphors. Don't throw a fit. That's a good one. I don't know what the throwing is here. That's that's. But that definitely sounds like an embodied metaphor uh, to me. Um, 
So don't uh, don't get yourself all tied up in knots thinking too hard this morning uh, about this. Uh, if you need a break today, call a friend and, and play the embodied uh, metaphor with them. You can sort of toss the ball to them and let them uh, come up with an embodied metaphor and then toss the ball back to you. Kick the can down the road. Excellent. That's a great one. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's move on. So what does this all have to do with robotics and specifically uh, evolutionary robotics? Well, as we saw from our human studies here, uh, it seems that humans may be able to um, break this uh, going in circles uh, problem by grounding language in the soil of action in the body. So let's imagine a hypothetical robot here. Let's imagine that this robot has pressure sensors in the soles uh, of its feet, and the robot uh, understands no English or no language whatsoever. But every once in a while, uh, over time, as the robot is acting and doing, doing something, every once in a while, um, it just happens uh, to move in such a way that all the pressure on the soles of its feet go to zero. So what I'm showing in this thick line here is sensor data over time. And it turns out from the robot's point of view, at the moment that it feels uh, the pressure sensors on its feet dropping to zero, it suddenly hears or receives the following from outside, out in the world. It receives J-U-M-P. The robot has no idea what J-U-M-P means, but the robot realizes that this happens again and again. So the next time that the pressure drops to zero, it again hears J-U-M-P. So the robot starts to understand J-U-M-P as this thing, when pressure goes to zero. So um, we could imagine making a robot that when we feed as input to the robot, J-U-M-P, it does this in response. The robot has learned a relationship between four symbols, J-U-M-P, and its own sensor motor experience. Okay. So imagine the robot learns a bunch of these kinds of things. Imagine that... Uh, it, it, there are other relationships it starts to learn. For example, that it has an accelerometer inside, and when that accelerometer is zero, and then it starts moving, so the accelerometer becomes non-zero, it hears uh, forward, or F-O-R-E-W-A-R-D. It doesn't know what those symbols mean, but it learns that when the accelerometer goes from zero to positive, it hears F-O-R-E-W-A-R-D. It also learns that when the accelerometer goes from zero to negative, it hears backward, B-A-C-K-W-A-R-D. So from time to time, it hears jump. From time to time, it hears forward. From time to time, it hears backward. During those three, those repeating events, those three events that repeat over and over again, sometimes when it hears jump, it also hears M-O-V-E. When it does forward, it also hears M-O-V-E, and sometimes when it does the third one, it also learns M-O-V-E. So the robot might start to learn what jump is, and forward is, and backward is, and learns that all of those three things are also M-O-V-E-M-E-N-T. So the robot might not just be able to ground certain words or symbols in action, but it might start to be able to ground increasingly abstract words in more motoric words. So a motoric word is something that really lights up the motor strip. It is a very specific action like lick, kick, push, jump, and so on. Those are motoric words. Something like movement is less motoric Political movement is even less motoric still and more abstract, and socialism is, is an even less uh, motoric and more abstract term. So this, it turns out that this is possible. We're going to see a robot that does this in a moment, which raises the question of whether a robot could do this or someday even do this. Is this how humans learn abstract concepts 
by grounding more abstract concepts in supporting more motoric concepts. Seems like a very ambitious goal, which it is, but remember that thinking about thinking is misleading. So let's switch from uh, socialism to democracy for a moment. Democracy is a might seem like a similarly abstract word. Can you think of any actions? What are some motoric words that might be associated with the very abstract word of democracy? So jump is sort of a supporting motoric word for movement. Movement is sort of a supporting motoric word for political movement. What might be some motoric words or actions or aspects of the body that relate to democracy? Voting. Voting is still an abstract word. You're right, though. It's a little bit more motoric. Gathering or grouping together. There's a good one. So obviously you can imagine a bunch of, bunch of people being bunched up together. That, that, that maybe is a supporting motoric concept for democracy. Think about our embodied metaphors. Are there some embodied metaphors that relate to the concept of democracy or voting? Running for office, that's a great one, absolutely. So what happens in democracy? Well, there's a lot of voting, and sometimes you have voting blocks, groups of people that vote in different ways, and they are pulling and pushing on, uh, on the various issues. So one of the dominating embodied metaphors for democracy is, um, uh, and I'm forgetting the name of that game where you have two people, uh, tug of war on a, on a rope. So you have a very long rope. There's eight people pulling in one direction on one end of the rope and eight people pulling on the other direction. Often democracy feels, literally feels, like that, that action. So although it may be difficult to imagine some very abstract words being grounded in more motoric language, as mentioned in the chat here, some of these embodied metaphors related to abstract concepts like democracy suggest that maybe it's possible. Okay, we're going to focus, however, uh, on the, the sort of lowest levels. Can a robot ground very motoric words in sensor motor uh, experience? Okay, we're going to test that idea by uh, in this experiment uh, that I carried out a few years ago with one of my students, Joey Annetzberger, um, which we called the Twitch Plays Robotics Project. As the name implies, we ran this project uh, on Twitch. And this project has four, or this experiment has four, uh, four phases to it, act, observe, learn, and predict. And I'll walk you through the first couple um, in the remaining few minutes that we have in class, and we'll talk about the other phases uh, next Tuesday. Okay, so um, the first the first part of this is we're going to try and evolve a large, or we're going to create a large number of simulated robots. In this case, uh, we created them in the Unity physics engine. This is just an alternative to PyroSim or Open Dynamics engine. As the simulation uh, was running on a local machine at UVM, we were capturing a live video stream of those simulated robots and sending them to uh, Twitch. And then in Twitch, we were observing the chat messages and capturing those chat messages back and storing them in a database. So the database was collecting a growing number of controllers and the crowd's responses to those uh, controllers. So I'll show you a video of this uh, in action, if I can. Okay, this is, as you can see in the video here, this is from la last year. Okay, so uh, what you're going to see here on the left are the simulated robots. They're running uh, just random controllers at the moment. 
So running just random controllers uh, at the moment. And in a moment, they will start running. Uh, I'm sorry. Let me try that again, just a moment. Okay, I, I think that's good enough for now. So you can see the blue robot on the left. We're going to play, uh, we're going to run random controllers, so there's no evolution yet. We're going to run random controllers on these simulated robots. And what you'll see on the right hand side is people typing various things uh, into chat. In a moment. What we asked the participants in the study to do is to think of the robots as uh, pets, that there is uh, a large number of uh, these, these robots don't speak English, but these robots may be able to understand uh, some aspects, might start to understand uh, or obey some natural language commands. And the game in Twitch Plays Robotics is for the crowd to figure out what commands to try and teach the robots. At this point in the video, in the uh, upper right panel here, you'll notice that people are voting for what they want to try and teach the robots next, and you'll notice that these are actually very motoric commands. Crawl forward, walk forward. They're voting on what they want to teach the robot, and at this point now they have decided they're going to try and teach the robot walk forward. The robot hears in its input layer W-A-L-K space F-O-R-W-A-R-D. So the robot doesn't know what these words mean. It's just receiving these letters as sort of vectors or numbers which trigger certain actions. And for each random controller that receives walk forward, people vote whether that controller caused the robot to move forward or back. Okay, so again, just to explain from the robot's point of view, the robot is being controlled by a random controller. The controller receives W-A-L-K space F-O-R-W-A-R-D. The robot, the random controller causes the robot to move in some way. And we get back from the crowd, although the network doesn't yet hear this. The neural network doesn't hear this yet. I've lost my, there we go. Okay, so the robot doesn't know that, but the, um, the robot, for each of these random controllers, we're, we're getting back social data. We're getting back five yeses and two noes for a given, uh, for a given controller. For a different controller, we get uh, two noes and six yeses. So that's the data that we're, we're collecting in the database. Okay, so let's uh, try and organize this data, and we'll finish with this uh, today. So in this initial experiment, we have two different robots, which you could see on the stream, R0 and R1. R0 was a simple worm robot lying on the ground, and R1 was an upright quadrupedal robot. So we have R sub i, i equals 0 is the worm, i equals 1 is the upright quadrupedal robot. For each of those two robots, we uh, those robots heard a whole num uh, a large number of commands issued by the crowd. So we just saw uh, one command, which was walk forward. Another one was walk backwards. Not both robots heard always heard heard the same command. One of our first findings from this study was that we told the crowd they could type anything into chat they wanted, and they typed in thousands of different commands. Most of the, most of the commands were very short motoric commands like you just saw. Walk forward, walk back, jump, turn left, turn right, and so on. Um, which we didn't tell the crowd to do. So 
what we're relying on here is that the crowd is somehow, um, humans are somehow instinctual teachers. They notice that these robots are not capable of much, so they simplify or scaffold the learning. They're going to start the robots off instinctually with simple, short, motoric commands. It's another example of scaffolding, which we've seen a few times uh, in this course. Most of the time they mentioned uh, very motoric words. Every once in a while uh, we saw things like prove Fermat's last theorem. Probably unlikely that the robot would be able to obey that command. Someone asked the robot to be, be yourself, which we thought was, was an interesting one. Um, someone typed in look at the camera, which actually was a pretty good one. I don't know if the robots were capable of obeying that one. And a large number of other commands. What we'll see next time is how the robots were able to actually successfully ground some of those motoric commands issued by the crowd uh, in appropriate action. Just as a reminder, you have a quiz due uh, tonight. Uh, you're all working on your final project uh, ideas. I will stay on the uh, stream now, uh, probably until about 10.30, I think, today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions about final project ideas or anything else from lecture or the course. Uh, otherwise, if you're uh, signing off, we'll see you uh, next Tuesday. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.